Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to um, this um, NYU pop-up uh, course for uh, this new course uh, I'm starting in spring 2022. Um, the title of the course is Introduction to Cybernomics, um, Valuation and Risk Measurement of Intangible Digital Assets. Um, so today is going to be a short introduction uh, to the course uh, with an overview of, of the course itself. Um, the, the session is gonna be around 20 minutes uh, with 10 minutes Q&A. So please leave your questions till the end and use the, the Q&A tool uh, in the Zoom call. And I will be able to address uh, any questions in the end of the, the presentation. So a little bit about me. Um, I am new to NYU. I'm starting um, uh, adjunct professorship uh, from spring next year. Um, I have been in tech for 22 years, uh, started to code at age 12, and currently I'm uh, working in chief security office uh, at Google and also leading uh, risk quantification and asset evaluation at um, Alphabet. Um, since five years ago, I've developing um, a, a set of economic and um, uh, risk theories uh, around intangible digital assets. Um, and this is the, the, the context of this course. Um, and also I'm uh, the founder and chair of uh, Happiness Foundation. It's a, a global collab collaborative research uh, foundation focused on how to um, develop models for uh, technology to optimize for human uh, well-being, happiness and fulfillment. So um, the course we're starting from spring 2022 is gonna be an uh, interdisciplinary course, um, primarily in the intersection of economics and computer science. Uh, it will also touch on a little bit of uh, philosophy and, and business and entrepreneurship, um, just because um, digital assets are now the backbone of the new uh, economic paradigm. Um, driven by the fourth industrial revolution. And the course is gonna be very much use case driven and uh, uh, digital assets are in uh, our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, it's everywhere from uh, smartphone to all the content we see on smartphones, um, uh, from crypto to NFTs and you know, all the data we store in, in cloud, for example. So it will be very much uh, a use case driven course uh, providing very tangible examples uh, of the theories. So the course is divided into three parts. Part one will uh, cover economics of intangible digital assets. We will discuss uh, the new digital value theory that uh, explains um, some of the unique uh, characteristics of uh, intangible digital assets. We will explore uh, valuation models that are unique uh, to intangible digital assets. Um, part two will cover risk measurement of digital assets. Um, so when, whenever there is value, there is associated risks and we need to look into risk management. Um, so uh, in part two, the course will cover uh, novel risk measurement units um, and also optimal risk management model um, for optimal security um, of digital assets. And part three, we will cover future of uh, digital economy and associated risks. Uh, primarily covering uh, future disruptive technology and the implication on future value and risk, uh, such as Web3 technologies, artificial intelligence, quantum AI, and all the other um, mega trends that will disrupt everything we know today. So um, um, the session is divided into three parts. So the first part is about the problem that we are trying to solve. Um, and the first problem is uh, that we do not know how to measure uh, good security. Um, we have 8 billion people on the planet and uh, 300 billion passwords, um, but still there is about 3 million lost to cybercrime every minute. So this is a clear example that we have not really figured out uh, cybersecurity. Um, cybersecurity is like a game, and today we know it very well that it is a technical game. But the fallacy is that threats come from the outside. That's why the traditional security model looks more like this. Um, everything is built around the wall, separating trusted systems from untrusted systems. But the reality is more like this. We have learned how that actually the walls are built more like eggshells and the threats more often come from the inside. A main driver for cloud migration today is better security that is built into modern infrastructure that is designed based on zero trust. 
But what is the end game? How to achieve optimal security? Optimal security is not having five layers of bulletproof doors in a neighborhood that has no crime. Optimal security is when it is good enough, but how to measure good enough? As I spend more time with chief security officers um, of the largest companies in the world, I understand cybersecurity is an economic game. Good enough is not to spend more than what is needed. Good enough is achieved when the cost to break is higher than the cost to build. The optimal security model has monetary values on it, and it should look like this. We should know how um, we should know the value we're protecting in dollar value, like you have a rough idea of how much your household belongings are worth. We should know how much of it is at risk, like what is measured in a standard property insurance policy. We should also know how much it costs to reduce risks to acceptable levels, like it takes 10 minutes phone call to get a quote for property insurance. We should know how to measure return on investment ideally as well. Today, most of these components are missing in the cybersecurity infrastructure, uh, infrastructure and industry. Uh, most of the decisions in cybersecurity are, are made from fear, doubt, uncertainty, rather than rational uh, data-driven uh, processes. And this is uh, the first problem that we are trying to solve. But why all of this is so hard? It is because of the second problem, that more fundamentally, we do not know the value of our digital assets. Can you put a number on all your data on Google Drive the same way as your household belongings? Today, digital assets are the backbone of global economy. We know what happens there by the minute and it is growing exponentially. But what exactly are digital assets? Apparently today we don't have a consistent understanding. Organizations like IMF, OECD, European commissions have different definitions of them. Companies today cannot trade without trademark. In 1957, NIS um, classification has established jointly by countries around the world to categorize goods and services we trade. Today, it covers little things like shoelaces, buttons, plasters, over 10 types of uh, shampoos, uh, 20 categories of nail products, but we do not uh, have such a common taxonomy for digital assets. There is also no accounting standards defining how digital assets should be reported on the balance sheet anywhere close to the granularity we have in the physical world. That is why even the biggest companies in the world cannot put dollar values to their digital assets. Another issue is that a large portion of digital value could, uh, could be invisible according to our current measure. The reported digital economy is only 6.9% of overall GDP in the US. This sounds like an underestimation because some of the world's most influential technology companies are American. In the meantime, 90% adults in the US have access to fast speed internet. What happens if we turn off the internet? Imagine driving with uh, paper maps, writing, calibrating on paper, sending snail mails, searching for answers to your question manually in libraries. In some cases, the non-digital alternative may not even be feasible at all. So losing, losing access to the digital option can cause significant loss of time and productivity of the workforce. But because access to such digital services are often free, it is not counted when we measure digital economy. And this leads to the third problem that we do not have a value theory that is ad adapted to our time. I looked into the body of uh, literature studying uh, the unique nature of various types of digital assets. For example, duplication does not increase dig digital value. Two cars means doubled value. Two documents means same or reduced value if information becomes inconsistent. Digital value creation does not decrease but increase through usage. Gumtree is a marketplace to sell second-handed physical goods at cheaper price, but Gumtree itself becomes more valuable when more people use it. Digital value reproduction requires much lower or zero cost. That's why digital platforms can scale so fast. And, and that's why Instagram brought down Kodak with only 13 employees. Digital value can be distributed via multi-sided markets. A bookstore is um, an one-side market, whereas uh, uh, where, where the merchant sells to one set of customers. Amazon, on the other hand, is a multi-sided market interacting with multiple seller and, and customer groups. The network effect becomes the core value generator for the business, and this is the driver behind uh, platform economy. Based on above, I concluded that um, digital value is limitless. 
This does not mean our resources are unlimited. It is more like the unlimited options to play Go. Current economic theories are based on scarcity, but digital value breaks this fundamental assumption. Limitless come from two things. First, once the owner has created intrinsic value, the asset becomes more valuable the more it is used. Second, because of this network effect, there are no limits in terms of opportunities to distribute and consume such value. This makes intellectual property critical to digital value creation. We are in the knowledge economy now, right? right? Um, books like Superintelligence and Second Machine Age tell us that uh, we are at a historical tipping point for human progress. And it looks like uh, what in this chart. Historically, major developments in our value theories have been driven by industrial revolutions. Machines and factories were invented during the first industrial revolution. That's when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations. Electric power and mass production were invented during the second industrial revolution. That's when marginal revolution happened. The digital economy has played a critical role in the third and now fourth industrial revolution. But we do not yet have a major economic breakthrough that can explain the new ways how value is created, distributed, and consumed. So here is a summary of the three problems uh, that are linked. The first problem is we do not know how to measure good enough security. The second problem is we do not know the value of our digital assets. And the third problem is we do not have a value theory that is adapted to our time. Now here is the beginning of some solutions which will be covered in this course. Um, the first solution is to define a new way to categorize assets and a set of new valuation models. Today, digital assets are often categorized based on their technical functions such as software, hardware, database, robots, etc. I created a new way to categorize digital assets based on their economic functions. It has two dimensions. The first dimension uh, differentiates core, uh, digital, uh, core value assets from supportive assets. Um, core value asset is what the business is. Think uh, software um, uh, for software companies, um, tech products for tech companies, algorithm for deep learning companies. Supportive assets are how the business is run. Think um, office productivity tools, messaging apps. The second dimension differentiates digitized assets from digital native assets. Digitized assets have an equivalent or sibling in the physical world. E-commerce come from commerce, e-governance come from governance. On the contrary, digital native assets are born digital, uh, such as the internet, cloud, blockchain, crypto, and artificial intelligence. Now we look at the valuation models. Existing valuation models can be leveraged for digital assets. We can measure software value using intrinsic value, which come from the cost of production, IP, labor, et cetera. We can measure the value of um, your credit card number, your personal data using extrinsic market value, which is based on market price in the black market at the moment. We can measure the value of your digital diary using subjective value, which is based on how, how uh, an entity is willing to pay, how much an entity is willing to pay. This also applies to your Facebook likes um, and uh, um, Instagram followers, et cetera. For many digitized assets, one part of their value come from the physical, uh, physical equivalent. For example, digitized photos, documents, videos, and this can be calculated from direct uh, financial conversion. Two new valuation models are created to address the unique nature of digital assets. Extrinsic usage value is uh, correlated with user base to reflect the, uh, the more an asset is used, the more valuable it becomes. Usage value is the main driver behind digitization because once a photo is taken, digitizing it increases how many people can access it as well as the shelf life. You upload once and it is available everywhere. Opportunity value is related to the concept of um, opportunity cost, uh, but also very different from it. It measures the value of using the digital option compared to the non-digital alternative. For example, using Google Maps compared to paper maps, using Google search compared to manual search. Sometimes the non-digital alternative may not exist. For example, today the most valued tech startups are all born in the cloud and may not have existed in the first place if cloud wasn't invented. 
This combined with uh, the common premium uh, freemium mo uh, model today lead to the paradox of opportunity value that a free digital asset can have infinite value for the lack of alternatives. This is how everything fit together. Uh, we are able to use three equations for the valuation of all assets. What is also interesting is that this matrix also reflects the biggest trends in technology today. Every industry is going through rapid digitization. We find digitization of everything um, here. Cyber is becoming the new critical infrastructure. We find it here. And here we find all the tech unicorns with a high concentration of exponential value. The second solution is to come up with a digital theory of value that can summarize um, and explain the unique phenomena seen in the digital economy. The digital theory of value has six laws. Um, we will cover a few highlights uh, in this session. The first one is the law of machine time. We all know Moore's law has been driving productivity growth in computing. The supercomputer built for complex nuclear simulation in the 1996 cost 55 million, take up 148 square meters. Only 10 years later, the same computing capacity was crammed into Sony PlayStation 3. But humans are inherently limited to comprehend such um, exponential growth that is close to 90 degrees. So if we translate Moore's law into a time scale that we can actually understand, if we use the progress in 2000 as a base year, we have achieved over 4,000 years of progress in 2018. This means our current policy and regulatory cycles are inherently lagged behind. We are solving today's problem from the Stone Age. In the early days of the web, we copied the physical world into the virtual space and in, in invented emails, e-commerce, etc. Whereas today, because the gravity of value is in the digital native, the physical world is rather accommodating the virtual space. There's a generation of digital nomads running online business from anywhere in the world. Mobile and flexible work is common in multinational companies, especially after COVID. Freelancers are predicted to be the majority workforce in the US within a decade. In China, access to e-commerce has brought the poorest villages into prosperity. The negative side is sometimes I don't know whether my devices are following me or I'm following them. We will also see the return of subjective value. Today, we are, also, we are so used to getting the same products like everybody else, from um, the supermarket to cars to furniture. But before mass production was invented, bespoke and customized solutions were the mainstream. Mass production was invented to minimize cost of labor and maximize efficiency of production. But labor and efficiency are no longer so important in the digital value creation uh, process. We will see the return of subjective value because of the demand for customization and the need to be entertained when people will work much less. It's important to note that today the willingness to pay is not only measured in dollars, but also in time and attention. Finally, of course, the robots are coming. We have progressed from the pyramid to Windows 95. We have been constructing a virtual civilization. If the future of governance is like an operating system, it will create a new division of labor that looks like this. There will be people who cannot keep up or below barrier to entry. This brings the discussion around new necessities in terms of digital literacy and access to devices and tools. Then there will be human labor that supports uh, the operating system. You have heard the new, uh, the next blue collar job is coding. Then there will be conventional human labor that is difficult to be, open, uh, to be automated because deep learning is still inherently limited, at least for many decades to come. Optimal intelligence will come from a combination of human and machine intelligence. Finally, uh, on top of the value chain, there is human labor that participates in the job creation in a new economy because um, I'm fundamentally optimistic and because accuracy is not the same as truth, computers cannot replace philosophers. So then we come to the, the final solution. Um, solution. The third solution is to create new, new units to measure cyber risk. Risk is a beautiful field because it is a perfect balance between facts and perception. It sits perfectly in the intersection between natural science and social science. The most dangerous part of a flight is the drive to the airport. 
More people die from falling coconuts than from shark attacks. We cannot manage what we can't measure, but we are able to measure risk today, just not in cyber. I have close friends in finance and medicine. Consistent units have been invented to measure mortality risk and market risk. The most fascinating thing is to measure risk from both objective and subjective perspectives. Um, so in order to uh, create um, units to measure cyber risk, um, I've looked into how to leverage existing risk units um, in medicine and finance. Um, so there is a, a, a widely adopted unit in medicine today called Micromod um, that is behind every single life insurance policy, tracking day-to-day uh, -day, uh, risk factors that influence um, everybody's mortality. Um, so one Micromod is defined as one in a million probability of death. The value of one Micromod is the amount of money a person is willing to pay to avoid one micromod. Um, so, so to give a tangible example, uh, one micromod equals eating 40 tablespoons of peanut butter or drinking half a bottle of red wine or smoking certain amount of cigarettes uh, or driving cars and flying and uh, skydiving. All these activities have um, been measured in, in terms of micromod. Um, the oldest mortality data set started from the 1600s and in the, in the 1970s, um, the uh, academics started to look for a mathematical model for mortality risk. And the micromod was first um, proposed academically in, in 1989. And today it is being used uh, widely in insurance policies. And the second unit that inspired uh, cyber risk units is value at risk. Um, this is much more well known because it is influencing uh, the financial markets um, on a daily basis. Um, it was um, first required as part of the New York Stock Exchange capital requirement in 1922, uh, first academically proposed in 1945, um, and introduced to the industry by JP Morgan's development um, of risk metrics, um, and then became open source and created the profession of quant. Um, and today, uh, quant quantitative analysts are still the highest paid profession on earth. And that profession was very much uh, created from the invention of uh, value at risk as a, as a risk unit. So VAR is the likelihood of losing a certain amount of money over a given period. Um, and combining these two, uh, we've created two units for measuring cyber risk. One is called Bitmort, um, and one Bitmort is defined as one in a million probability of uh, digital death of a certain class of uh, digital assets. Um, digital, de digital death is defined as a binary condition when the asset loses all of its economic value. And the subjective uh, value of one Bitmort of a given class of asset is the amount of money an entity is willing to pay to reduce one Bitmort for its uh, class D um, assets. And HECLA is an aggregated measure um, inspired by Bitmort, uh, by uh, value at risk. Um, the objective measure of HECLA is defined as a probability where a 12 months HECLA VAR is the loss limit an entity can afford from cyber incidents. And the subjective measure of um, HECLA is the amount of money the entity is willing to pay to reduce its HECLA by 1% for the same loss limit. With these uh, units, we are able to um, add a dollar value to the initial optimal security model that uh, introduced at the beginning of the, of the uh, talk. Uh, we are able to collect um, an inventory of digital assets uh, and uh, assign value to them using the valuation models introduced, uh, introduced earlier in the, in the session. And we're able to use HECLA to articulate an entity's cyber risk limit, articulate an entity's cyber risk appetite, and we're able to use Bitmort to articulate an entity's willingness to pay for risk reduction for digital assets and use HECLA to measure the cost of risk reduction and also measure an entity's risk pricing. And ultimately, we are able to measure the cost effectiveness of uh, any controls, as well as the return of investment uh, for cyber resilience. So the summary of the uh, three solutions is uh, we have created new ways to categorize assets and the new valuation models. We have created a set of digital theory of value that is adapted to our time 
and we have created new units to measure cyber that can contribute to an uh, optimal security model and, and the digital resilience overall. So what is in the future? Um, Cybernomics is a body of a study dedicated to these three problems and solutions introduced in this talk. Um, there are three views of cybernomics, the entity view, uh, which is whether it's individual, government, company, or any kind of organization. And there's a portfolio uh, view, which is a collection of the entities. Um, it could be industry, it could be nation state, it could be alliances, um, et cetera. And then we have a global view, which is where we introduce uh, standards and policies um, around um, asset valuation and, and risk uh, management. Uh, a very important part of the future is also balancing digital growth with human joy creation. And that led to my uh, founding of the Happiness Foundation, because as you can see, digital growth is exponential and we are heading towards a 90 degree curve of exponential growth. Um, but that growth does not mean that we are becoming happier. So how can we actually um, integrate fundamental human values um, such as well-being and happiness into digital growth, I think is gonna be extremely important for the new economic paradigm. Um, I will end the talk with uh, limitless computing has arrived and what is the new scarcity? And we are at the beginning of a new paradigm and it's time to reimagine progress and value. Thank you. Um, so just to answer a few questions on the chat, um, is this going to be mathematically heavy? No. Um, so we will require um, uh, some um, basic understanding of economics and, and computer science, but we will not go to uh, uh, deep math uh, in the introductory course. Um, and we might have some optional uh, exercises that are that has a bit more math, uh, but this is not uh, a mandatory requirement. Um, so the second question, whether digital assets, natural resources are utilized in their creation and growth, um, how and where does the carbon account occur? So that's a very good question. Um, and so, as I said, the, the uh, limitless, um, limitlessness of digital assets is only the intangible part. Um, and all the intangible assets have a energy requirement, uh, and I think that is a very important consideration into the actual cost of uh, producing those assets, and we will be able to look more into this uh, during the course. Uh, the grading structure will be uh, shared with uh, uh, prospect students uh, through um, the program, uh, the course program team. Um, it will be a, a combination of quizzes, uh, homework and exams, and also uh, a final project. I will be able to send a list of books related to uh, digital value creation. Uh, and also I have uh, my own book um, um, as part of the course as well that I can recommend to all of you. Um, basic understanding of computer science. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, so let me think about um, uh, some more specific way of defining what that means. And I will discuss with the program team and share with uh, prospect students. Um, I'm sure there are ways to prepare for it if you have zero computer science knowledge. Um, I think technology is everywhere in our life now. So um, we are all connected to computer science already. So um, I will come back to you on this. That's everything. Is there any other questions? Please feel free to email me with uh, any more questions. And uh, I'm sure uh, Chrissy and, and Corey will share with you the recording if people have missed the session. And I'm looking forward to um, meeting you soon uh, in the course. Thank you.